Hey, aloha, and welcome to Stan Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. Stan Osterman, coming to you live and direct from the beautiful metropolis of Kailua, Hawaii, on the windward side of Oahu. And um, for those of you that haven't started making your plans to visit Hawaii, um, it's never too late. Just keep checking on the stupid state rules for COVID so you don't get stuck. But um, other than that, the weather's beautiful, the surf's looking good, especially on the South Shore. Come on out and visit Hawaii. Anyway, we got a great show today. I'm going to start off with some good news. Um, if we can roll up picture, um, we delivered our first Toyota fuel cell vehicle to the Big Island of Hawaii. It's a Toyota Mirai right here, still covered and encrusted in salt, courtesy of Young Brothers. Um, it was delivered to Kauai High Harbor on the Big Island, and that's Paul Pontio from Blue Planet Research, using his uh, Millennium Rain uh, fueling station to put some hydrogen in the car. And he's been driving it around, washed it up, cleaned it up really good and it's looking beautiful so now we have a hydrogen fuel cell car in the big island for folks to uh to try out when they go up to visit paul at the ranch there at blue planet research so thanks to everybody who helped get that together and today's show we're going back to visit um uh an, an organization that i i interviewed um 2019 about middle of 2019 as i recall and um, it's one of my favorite utilities here in Hawaii because it's a co-op and it's the only co-op that I know of that um, does electricity in the state um, and is independent of Hawaiian Electric and, and their operations. Um, they're also really well established, not only locally, but they've got a great reputation nationally. And they're doing some pretty innovative and some pretty advanced things with their uh, intermittent renewables, solar and wind and things like that. So. Um, the guest today is Mr. Brad Rockwell. He's uh, running operations over at Kauai Island Utility Co-op. And uh, welcome, Brad. Good to have you on board today. Hey, thank you, Stan. Good to be here. Yeah, it's been a while. It has, a couple years, and uh, things have, I guess, uh, you know, with COVID and everything, it's keeping us, um, keeping things interesting over here in the electricity business. I bet. Well, Let's, uh, why don't we start off by uh, giving the audience a little bit of background on uh, yourself and what you do at KAC. Sure, yeah. As you said, I'm Chief of Operations, so I um, oversee our uh, generation, transmission, distribution, basically keeping the lights on, and uh, grid operations, uh, and also our renewable development, our IT department, our planners. Um, so, yeah, I like to say, you know, keeping the lights on is kind of how you boil it down. Uh, spent a lot of my career in developing our renewable projects here on the island of Kauai. Extremely proud of uh, the fact that we've gone from 8% renewable about 11 years ago in 2010 to 67% for 2020. So we've been on a very aggressive push to... Uh, uh, get toward the 100% renewable and been pretty successful along the way. Learned some lessons as well. Um, my background is as a mechanical engineer, always been in power generation uh, on the civilian side of my career, did some time in the Navy as well, active duty and, and in the reserves. So uh, been here with the co-op, uh, well, been here on Kauai since 2001. The co-op formed in uh, late 2002 and I uh, became a part of that shortly after they formed through uh, an acquisition. They bought the power plant I was uh, working at. So uh, I, I don't know if the audience appreciates this, but most mm -hmm. utility grids can't handle even 20% intermittent renewables on their grid. And you say you're up in the high 60%? 67% renewables. That includes our firm renewables, if you will, are biomass and hydro, as well as the solar. Um, uh, and that's on an annual basis. Uh, on an instantaneous basis, we actually routinely exceed 80% from intermittent renewables, the solar. Uh, that's A lot of that is backed up with battery storage. Um, and when you add in the, the biomass and the hydro, we're routinely hitting 100% renewable, where we're not burning a single drop of oil uh for multiple hours at a time on sunny days here that's that's really impressive um on, on the spinning reserve side is that where you're do you still have to run a, a diesel for spinning reserve 
so yeah, we if if we if we're running um, 100% renewable, we're going to be keeping um, one of our conventional units operating in what we call a synchronous condenser mode. It's not consuming any fuel, but we're rotating the generator to provide inertia, that rotating mass, which helps us with uh, keeping frequency stable. It also provides some voltage support, some dynamic voltage support, and um, and also provides fault current, which is something that uh, we use, all electric grids use to provide protection across the electric grid. When there's a fault, like a power line that comes down, it causes an overcurrent and our relays, our protection devices sense that overcurrent, but that overcurrent can only exist if there's uh, devices on the system to provide that high current, like the synchronous condenser generator that we operate when we're running 100% renewable. That's that's a really good explanation. I hadn't heard too many people talk about that that aspect. Um, you know, recently KAUC was recognized by a national organization for basically a lot of what you just talked about. Can you kind of tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah, we're we're really proud. Um, we've been. Uh, it was the Smart Electric Power Alliance or SEPA, uh, as they're known, and it's a, a national. Uh, organization that is really focused on renewable energy and, and smart electric grid type uh, solutions. We've been a part of a member of them for oh, a decade or more. We've received a number of awards for, um, you know, solar installed per capita, uh, storage installed per capita, and things like that. But this was, uh, this was really nice to be recognized uh, for sort of all of the above, everything we've been doing and to be recognized as the electric cooperative of the year. They do, uh, they announce investor owned utility of the year, municipality of the year, and electric cooperative of the year. And we, we kind of got it for uh, our renewable portfolio standards that, like I mentioned, the 67% on an annual basis, and also for the being able to operate at 100% um, at any one time, as well as uh, some of our projects, some of our really innovative solar and storage projects and our pumped hydro uh, project that we're working to bring online. So um, yeah, happy to get into any of those details, but it was really sort of a recognition of all of the things we've been working on and have achieved. When I read the article, I was really impressed. And I think I even wrote a comment because I, I saw it in Pacific Business News and I, I wrote a comment back to the newspaper saying, this is really a great accomplishment for a, a small local local company to get that kind of recognition, especially for what you did. I mean, again, I got to emphasize that to have that much renewable on the grid, um, especially at times 100% production and so much of it being solar, um, that's no small feat. And I'd, I'd venture to say even Hawaiian Electric is probably pretty damn jealous of, uh, of KAUC right now. Um, cause I don't think they could come close to doing that. They have a bigger grid, of course, and a lot more complex, uh, issues, but, you know, still you, you guys have stepped out where very few utilities have gone. Um, let's talk a little bit about the, um, the solar side of that, uh, about what percentage of your, um, generation is solar in terms of, I know you say at times you run a hundred percent, um, solar, but, um, in terms of what you, you average, you use average and, and how much of your grid you kind of count on for solar on a daily basis. You know, how many how many kilowatts yeah. or megawatts do you do you generate? Yeah, on, on I mean, you, you know, depending on how you slice it, if we look on an annual basis, we're getting about 40% of our energy from solar. Um, and so it's just eclipsed, it's just become the number one provider you know our, our four sources on this island are solar uh small hydro biomass and oil of course so solar is now the predominant form oil is second uh, at around 33 percent um and then we've got biomass and hydro um so on an annual basis about 40 like i said it, it on an instantaneous basis if you look at those times we're running 100 percent renewable we can hit as much as 80 percent coming from solar uh, and like I said, a lot of that is backed up with battery storage. Um, so, yeah, and then of course at night, we're getting 
you know, nothing from solar. Um, we're still getting some from our battery. So it's, it's, uh, it varies quite a bit. But is, uh, is most of that solar going to battery? Um, I would say about, uh, probably about half of it is, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but we have, you know, our island all time peak demand is 80 megawatts. We set that in the summer of 2019. Um, and, um, and if you look at how much solar capacity we have installed, it's well over a hundred megawatts. So clearly, you know, on an islanded grid where we don't have a connection to any place else, we have to always keep things in balance. And so, um, you know, we can't clearly take a hundred megawatts of solar if our all time peak demand is only 80. So a lot of that has to be stored in batteries that we can then use later on at night when we don't have the standalone solar competing for the, the time. And you mentioned biomass. Could you describe that system? You know, what sure. is it a gasifier or what exactly are you running? No, it's a, it's a conventional boiler, a, a traveling great boiler. So it's a, it's a, it's a unique project in its own right. It's um, uh, closed loop biomass plants. So they have their own plantation of uh, eucalyptus trees that they're growing and um, uh, roughly 3000 acres. And then they're um, continuously harvesting uh, those trees and chipping them up. And then they, they, you know, haul the wood chips from the field uh, to the power plant. They, they put them on uh, into a sort of a fuel hall. And then that goes over to the boiler where it's combusted and it generates a steam, high pressure, high temperature steam that drives a steam turbine generator. Right. Is, is that similar to the technology that, what is it on the big island, uh, Honua Ola is gonna be used? I think it is, yeah. I don't know too much. Um, I haven't seen you know the specifics of Honua Ola, but I, I think it would work essentially the same. Yeah. What do they do for carbon capture in that process? You know. Uh, there is no specific carbon capture. Uh, they do have, you know, uh, scrubbers, uh, emission control equipment, yeah. yeah, to meet to meet their air permit requirements. But um, as far as greenhouse gas emissions, it's you know, I know that sort of whether you look at it on a life cycle basis or not, you know, is debatable. But um, their greenhouse gas emissions, they claim, are you know, offset by the trees that they're growing. Right. Uh, right. So. Yeah, they're they're using the trees to collect carbon, right? And and then they they put some of it back in, and okay, yeah, it's kind right. of a net neutral. So, how about your in-stream hydro that you've got now? Um, you know, I'm actually really intrigued with in-stream hydro. I've been exposed to a little bit on on the Big Island, but um, I just can't imagine if we if we took the time to refurbish some of our um, old blooms from sugar plantations and pineapple, why we couldn't do some small scale in-stream hydro that would add up to a lot of electricity over time, because basically you got water running downhill all the time, you know, and right now it's just running downhill. And if yeah. you could put some generators in that stream along the way, um, it could actually generate overall quite a bit of electricity. Um, what's your experience with uh, in-stream hydro over on Kauai? Yeah, we, I mean, I think there is some untapped potential. Um, uh, we, we have a number of sugar plantation era in-stream hydro plants that operate and continue to provide a, a valuable uh, contribution to our renewable portfolio standards. Um, and we're also looking to develop, we're in development on a new um, in-stream hydro combined with uh, solar PV that's going to um, use that solar energy to pump water uphill between two existing reservoirs that need to be refurbished. So we're going to, instead of using battery, chemical batteries to store this solar energy, we're now going to use more conventional, you know, water reservoirs and pump that water uphill about 1500 feet, and then we'll run it down uh, in a new modern, you know, hydro turbine generator. We have... Um a catchment system at the bottom. So when you're pumping, you basically you're just recirculate, recirculating the water between yeah. two reservoirs where when you have excess energy, you're pumping water uphill. 
And then when you need energy, you let the water run through your turbine and you generate power, which is really a great long-term uh, energy storage option, um, especially if you have the space to put in a really big reservoir and pump from a really big reservoir, you can store quite a bit of energy. So about, about what percentage does that system take up on your, on your grid right now? Um, well, if that project is successful in coming online, it will amount to about between 20 to 25% of our annual energy. And uh, like I said, there's a hydro component of it and there's a solar component. So um, uh, most of the energy will actually be coming from the solar, uh, which we then just, you know, either send some direct to grid, but most of that will be used to pump water uphill and then come back down through the hydro turbine. So I think we count that as, we probably will count that as solar energy, even though it's coming to the grid via hydro turbine. Um, because it's really produced, it's created by yeah. the solar panels. That initial energy to pump it up the hill came from the solar panel, so I, I right. agree with you. I know last time we talked, I, I kind of hit you with my favorite subject, which we started this show up with, which is hydrogen. And um, and I actually, even though I was disappointed that you guys weren't using it, um, I thought your explanation of why um, the utilities haven't really kind of gotten into hydrogen for larger scale energy storage was really probably explained best by you compared to any of the other utilities I've talked to. And that's just that the technology is still growing, still becoming more cost-effective, still not in mainstream use on the grid. Um, but I, I noticed that in San Diego, there is finally a utility that's gonna be using hydrogen for energy storage. Has KIUC thought about that at all at least maybe even consider it for future use yeah i think i think we think about i mean i know i personally do as the guy who's kind of responsible to figure out what are our you know power needs are going to come from in 5 10 20 years from now um you know at some point um we can continue to do solar and, and storage and this pump storage hydro and but you know what else is out there um we're not gonna be able to build those types of renewables to get us to 100%. We're gonna need our existing conventional generating units um, to probably handle that last five to 10% just because you know the contingency situation of a week of clouds where you don't get solar energy or, or something like that is gonna always be there. And, and you know we need to be able to provide the power. So those conventional generating units might be powered with a liquid biodiesel, which is renewable. Sure. Um, or it could be hydrogen. You know, we've got a number of uh, gas turbines. Um, our GE LM2500 is our single largest generating unit here. It could um, it's set up to run on gaseous fuels. You know, you could run a mix of hydrogen or maybe even pure hydrogen. I know GE has done some tests on that, and and we're kind of keeping our finger on the pulse of that. But um, yeah, I mean, a gaseous, a renewable gaseous fuel is definitely of interest to us and, and especially where we might be able to create that fuel ourselves by using otherwise curtailed solar PV energy to run an electrolyzer and then you know store that hydrogen that we can then use on demand. Um, yeah, that, the key to getting to 100% renewable grid is gonna be long duration storage, whether it's this pump storage project we're talking about or having a tank of hydrogen or tanks of biodiesel, so you need you need more than what battery technology can provide, which is, you know, just a few hours. We need days of storage if we're going to really exactly. do 100 percent. Yeah, I think people really don't appreciate the amount of energy in a barrel of oil or, you know, a couple of gallons of diesel fuel. Or it's, it's rather energy dense. And, you know, when you think about how much energy we actually consume over a 24 hour period, um, and then translate that into, okay, how much solar do we need that only runs five, six hours a day in terms of rated capacity off the solar panels? You know, we've got to store an awful lot of energy to have that two or three weeks of backup that right now oil provides without even thinking about. Um, but sure. when it comes to renewables, we're going to have to be, you know, resilient enough to operate several weeks potentially um, on some kind of other stored energy. And batteries certainly are great for the quick re quick response and the not hours, but for days and weeks, it's probably not the best option. Your your pumped hydro um, storage, 
is actually kind of in the same category with hydrogen for long-term storage. What kind of, compared to batteries, what, what does a project like that cost compared to batteries over a, a long term, like 20, 30 years? Uh, it's pretty comparable. We're, um, we've put out that the, um, the average cost of energy from that project will be about 15 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, and uh, when you consider the long duration storage we get from it and the firm capacity contributions from it, uh, we think it is on par with uh, slightly cheaper solar and chemical battery storage projects, which you know we've done in the 11 cent per kilowatt hour range, but I think more recently they've been around 12 cents and things like that. So um, this is a, a unique project that aside from the benefits it provides the electric grid, there's some wonderful community benefits as well. It's gonna be bringing um, water over to Department of Hawaiian Homelands uh, so they have irrigation, the ability to use irrigation water and to um, allow their pastoral lessees to use that water to do um, some farming and ranching on, on some lands that are pretty arid right now and don't have any sort of infrastructure. We're going to uh, improve the road access so uh, people have roads and have the ability to get electricity up there and things like that. So it, it provides some nice benefits to Department of Hawaiian Homelands as well as taking care of some dam liability issues for uh, Department of Land and Natural Resources and also helping uh, the uh, Agribusiness Development Corporation and Kekaha Ag Association and their agricultural pursuits. Would you say that that aspect, the collateral benefits to agriculture and things is maybe one of the strengths of KAUC as a utility that you're able to actually assist um, other communities and, and other um, um, industries like agriculture to, yeah. to meet their goals? W would, you, would you consider that to be one of the real keystones to your operation? Well, it's the strength of co-ops in general. We have uh, seven cooperative principles and, and one of those is concern for community. So we're always focused on the community. And, and what's nice about the electric co-op structure is we don't have shareholders uh, per se we have i mean our rate payers are our shareholders so we're completely aligned with uh, our constituents the rate payers and what their needs are so um, we want to do whatever is going to benefit our community and we don't have sort of external interests that are uh, pulling at us that we need to try to satisfy so so after almost 20 years of having your um, kuc in existence um have your your customers your members um do they do they seem fairly pleased with the the results of having their own um customer owned utility i mean i i think so that's a broad question there's always people who aren't too happy with their electric company i don't care where you are um, i hear you <laughs> but um you know we've done member surveys every year uh, for many, many years now, and the results are, are getting better. Um, we think for the most part, um, the fact that we've been so successful in renewables, which I think all of our members appreciate the fact that that has translated into very stable and lower electric rates, uh, especially when you consider inflation, uh, has been appreciated by our membership. And the fact that they have a voice, you know, they, the board of directors um, who uh, we have nine board of directors that are elected by the ratepayers. They're all, you know, leaders in the community. Uh, our members have a voice to reach out to them and they're the ones who set, you know, the strategic direction and they provide the governance. Uh, they hire and fire our CEO, my boss. And so they have a uh, real tangible control of, you know, the electric future of this Island. So, you know that that actually is a microcosm of what I, I think could be fixing our country right now. Is, you know, we're supposed to be of, by, and for the people. Well, when you're running a co-op, um, your customers basically are the people that vote you in and out of office, so to speak. Um, as you said, with your CEO um, being being on the cutting cutting table if uh, if uh, everybody's not happy with them. So. Um, I'd say you guys have a, a really great model, and I'm really thrilled to be able to talk to you and, and you know, get
get some insight on what you're doing and hear about your success and your ongoing success. So we've got a couple of minutes left. Can you tell us anything that, um, you know, that you can, I'm sure a lot of it's close hold on, on what KAUC is doing to go into the future and, uh, and maybe even make things better. I think we're, I mean, we're looking at using technology in a number of ways. Um, you know, we've talked enough about renewables, so I won't go there, but, um, trying to improve reliability, um, you know, over here on the garden Island, it's probably no surprise that we have, you know, uh, trees that contact our lines and, you know, keeping, uh, the growth, uh, in check in our rights away or, or can be challenging. So we're looking into things like satellite advanced satellite technology that, um, might be more efficient than sending people around to look at uh, where we're, you know, our rights of way are getting encroached in, in satellites that can look at both horizontal and vertical, you know, where is this growth starting to creep up a little too close to our line so we can be more proactive about it. <clears throat> We've also got an amazing uh, automated metering infrastructure system. So essentially the whole island, about 95% of our customers, our members have uh, smart meters. So we're able to do uh, a lot of things with that. Uh, we know when the power's out for our members before they do in many cases, and we can roll a truck to fix it before they ever have to call us. Uh, we can give them notifications about it. Um, so that's pretty amazing. Our customers can see their energy use on a 15 minute interval. Uh, so there's some great things like that. We're looking to do uh, some more with cybersecurity, which is of course on everyone's mind, making sure that we're not a a victim of some sort of a, an attack and that that impacts, um, you know, everyone on the island uh, relies on us doing our job well and doing it right. So we need to make sure that we're always there for them. Great. Have you guys considered, especially for some of your isolated communities, maybe doing dispatchable power or like little microgrids for quadrants of your island? Or is that um, a little bit too far down the road yet? No, we have. We, I mean, we're looking at uh, one of the challenges is providing reliable power to the North Shore here. We've got, you know, the transmission line that goes over the mountains. And, and we tried many years ago to run one along the coast and that sort of got stopped and, and we weren't able to uh, complete that line. And so we're, you know, looking at does it make sense to build, you know, a redundant line up there or maybe just do some sort of a, a microgrid capability up there. Uh, land is, is, you know, space is pretty tight up there, so it can be a little challenging. Um, we have some experience with microgrid for the Pacific Missile Range facility. Uh, we just finished uh, within the last year, we brought online a, a new solar and storage project out there that has a, the ability of island the base loads uh, if there is a problem with the grid. So um, that's exciting. That's uh, being done completely with that solar and battery project. Uh, and no conventional generation. So um, we've got a little bit of experience there and hopefully we can leverage that for some other areas that make sense. Great. Well, believe it or not, Brad, we've kind of ripped through 30 minutes and um, <laughs> we got a lot covered and, and I learned a lot of new stuff too. And again, really proud of what you guys are doing over there. You're doing a great job. And I hope that uh, a lot of other utilities can, can learn from you. Um, so, Keep up the good work, and if you don't mind, we'll get back with you in another few months, probably not as long as it took since the last interview, and we'll catch up with KIUC again. Would that be okay? Sure. No problem, Stan. Thanks, and keep okay. up the good work with the show. All right. Thanks, Brad. Take care, okay. and we'll see you next week on Stan the Energy Man. Aloha.